Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm from the Science Club and the Environmental. Um, over here we have Steve and, and Haley. If you guys would like to introduce yourselves. Steve Jones, uh, president of Ocean County College of the Science Club. And I'm Haley. I'm just prominent in the Environmental Club. <laughs> And today we're here to talk about uh, a couple of different topics that we feel like are important to us. Um, we're going to be discussing fungus and some, some things that we find are valuable with the environment. Um, first, uh, should I start off with the cycle of fungus? You could start off with that. Okay, so in order to talk about fungus, uh, let me just introduce how the whole cycle of fungus works. Um, Basically, there's three main phases that fungus has throughout its life cycle. Um, the fruiting body, which is, which is known as the mushroom, which most people are familiar with. Um, the spore, which is a single-celled organism. And then there is also uh, the mycelium, which lives under the ground. So what happens is you have the fruiting body, which is the mushroom, uh, pop out of the ground. It has gills underneath, or usually like these little holes that release the spores. That usually happens when the conditions are either wet or um, whenever it feels as if the uh, soil is a good condition for the spore. So what happens is the mushroom pops out after like a nice rainstorm, spreads the, the spores, the spore hits the ground, and that's where the germination starts. So uh, the spore hits the soil, and then it starts to reproduce asexually, sort of like a chain underneath the ground and it creates these networks called mycelium. And then they spread, they go throughout the ground, um, breaking up nutrients, and once the uh, soils become rich and uh, when it becomes a good condition again for the spores, the mushroom, it's gonna go back up to the surface and uh, produce another mushroom, another fruiting body. So this is uh, some good information that can be used, that we found useful, that led us to do a science experiment. Um, we ended up... Uh, I, think it's, I think it's useful to mention that when people toss around the word fungi, it goes hand in hand with mushrooms, yeah. It's also important to note that only 10% of fungus mm -hmm. actually exists as a fruiting body. 90% yeah. of fung fungal species exist as what you were saying, like uh, filamentous, molds or yeah they, they exist in a mycelial form mm -hmm. so we have this this idea of fungus and mushrooms but there's so many that are well what you'd consider naked to uh to the you know not really yeah. not really yeah. visible yeah. not really visible to the human eye yeah it's an importance we can't see yeah exactly mm -hmm. and out of that and i'm getting these numbers from mycelium running which is a book by mm -hmm. Paul Stamets, leading uh, mycological researcher. He says that only, so we, we know that 10% exist as mushrooms, mm -hmm. the other 90% exist as, uh, only as mycelium. Of that 90%, it's estimated that only 10% is known. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's, the, it's a very expanding field, and I think it's important that people like us, Science Club especially, or, Environmental Club are, are doing research and getting people interested in this. Yeah. Why it's... are mushrooms so important though? Like, okay. <laughs> so they have a, a lot of purposes. There's I, definitely a lot. It, it falls on two main reasons, I'd say. Well, we, we could say that it's important for, as a source of nutrition, you know, that, like that, mm -hmm. that's important. But the two, the, the crux of their importance falls upon the fact that they could be used to bioremediate, mm -hmm. or what, that's a, in layman's terms, use mushrooms or fung fungus to clean up pollution. Fung fungal species and microbes in general, they're unique because they're not, they're not picky, you know, they're, they're, their life, like, uh, their they nutrition. They adapt quickly. Yeah, they adapt quickly, mm -hmm. and they're, they're notable for being able to metabolize hydrocarbons, yep. which most things are made of, of plastics made up of hydrocarbons. Um, you and I are made up of hydrocarbons. Most organic matter, yep. or all organic matter, I'd say, um, it's made up of hydrocarbons. And so what these mu mushrooms are able to do, different mushroom species were seeking out to use them to our benefit, 
but right now people are using them to clean up oil spills, mm -hmm. uh, use them to clean up pollution. Specifically, we'll, we'll, we could elaborate on this actually by talking about our experiment. The experiment I think that, that be... was done. So. Well, well, first we can, ex can finish that one statement. So what you were saying with oil spills and pollution and stuff like that, but that's why it's so important to know a lot about mushrooms is because like there's a lot of pollution that's going on. So there's oil spills all over the world, not just mm -hmm. when we hear about them on TV and the Gulf and stuff like that. Just a couple months ago, there was an oil spill in the Amazon. No one knew about it. What mm -hmm. do we do about it? You know, and it's important to research that and understand it and almost uh, endorse it so we can move forward and help the environment. And it's awesome to know some things like that. Yeah. Mentioning bringing up the Amazon, that brings up, that reminds me of the other point why fungus is so important. Because not only can we use them to bioremediate, but the Amazon specifically, it's, it's um, you could call it nature's medicine box. <laughs> right. Really. We, could use, we yeah. could use microbial species like fungus as medicine. And I, I'd say between 1997 and 2007, over 50% of our medicine came from the, the rainforest. Mm that was biosourced by bioprospectors, by scientists seeking them out. You know, like I, like I said, most of these fungal species are hidden to the, to the naked eye. Yeah. They exist as, the, as mycelium. So we, as researchers, have to actively seek them out. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a passive process. We're not, it's not gonna find us, yeah. per se. And we, there's so many different species out there that it's, it's something that you really have to go out and put forth the effort Especially like what you were saying before about um, how much that we do know with the species of fungus that are out there, and then how much that we don't. It's it's something that's very exciting to to be looking into and understand. Just in general, in the realm of science, what is to be known compared to what is known mm -hmm. that you can't even compare them. <laughs> yeah, we have microbiology is a field less than a hundred years old. You know, it's I mean, it's a very new arguably, science. arguably. Um, biology always ex emerging, chemistry less than a hundred years old that we know most of these concepts. Yeah. And I think it's just important for like our demographic to almost be active in, uh, active in these fields. So. And moving forward with that, you guys did an experiment with the mushrooms. Oh yeah, so right? yeah, let's, yeah. let's so, not forget about that. Yeah. Um, so one of our friends, colleagues, JP Steinberg, mm -hmm. Uh, a fan of Paul Stamets, mm -hmm. as are we, had come up with an idea to test the theory of bioremediation by saying, hey, what if we could find a couple species of microbes that could metabolize plastic? You know. Well, what is bioremediation? Bioremediation, bio remediate. So you're using life forms to remedy or clean up to solve a problem. Yeah. Bioremediation in this sense is using it to clean up pollution. We wanted to test the theory of whether or not these microbes could metabolize plastics. So we said, well, we, we had this great idea. Why don't we try to introduce them into a landfill, right? Yeah. We were met with a lot of obstacles to do that you got to petition people, you got to do, first you have to have preliminary research, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just say, well, we're going to introduce these microbes into the environment and mm -hmm. see what happens. Yeah. So what we, you know, what we did was we said, why don't we create a test? Why don't, why don't we create a test to see whether or not this concept, it, Work will work. Will work. Will work. Will work. Oh, Not only will work, so but will work. Will work right. effectively. Right. Yeah. So and we, efficiently. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, what <laughs> we would have to do, you know, we would have yeah. to uh, do. This would prove a baseline to show to see to a bigger picture. To, yeah, to present yeah. this argument to a possible local landfill to let them take to, on the idea. Yeah, and to have them let us implement. So what does implement. it do to the plastic? Does it decompose it or? Interestingly enough. And Out of the different, it, like, we, we tested we tested several different species of microbes, four species of fungus, what you'd consider fungus, one species of slime mold, which is actually not a fungus. It's a little different. It was thought to be a fungus up until 
50 years, like about 50 years ago, give or take. But people actually reclassified it and it's now considered a slime mold, but it has a very similar chemical nutrition, uh, metabolizes hydrocarbons, like a lot of microbes. So these are, they're literally eating the plastic. They are literally eating the plastic. Yeah. Well, we, we, we anthropomorphize <laughs> the word eat okay. to human beings right. to eat it. But yeah, it, it will literally use or metabolize these substances to make it useful for its own nutrition. Now, does it, because there's so much stuff that goes into plastic that it is, is it, does it affect the mushroom in any way in like a long-term cause or? That what I'm. That's one of the questions that we That's have another to, one of the yep. questions that we, that we're that's, coming up with. That's more so something that we would find out long-term. Mm -hmm. so, so how far, long has this experiment been going on? We tested it for, I'd say mm. two or three months. Yeah. Okay. Um, you yeah, know, a little over eight that. weeks. Yeah, so it was very much a short-term uh, type of experiment. Well, what but was the we were outcome of the short-term experiment? Well, testing the concept, we were able to prove our hypothesis. There are species of microbes that do metabolize plastic. And the, meta the types of plastic that we were able to metabolize, uh, polystyrene, people might know, know as styrofoam. Mm -hmm. We were able to show that, look, these, these microbes could begin to colonize and metabolize it. Um, other plastics, polyethylene, what you'd say that like a water bottle, like clear plastic water bottle, what that's made out of. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to start to see the beginning of the process of, the process of, met of metabolizing. And you gotta consider, these are gonna take hundreds of years to fully right. me metabolize. Not necessarily like the small amounts that we did, mm -hmm. but to make- The it, amount of plastic yeah. that we actually do have in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because so. I was actually just reading something about that in a National Geographic article where if we were to all go away and disappear, we would actually, like a billion years later, we would, there would actually be a settlement of plastic as mm -hmm. if it was like a layer of crust over the earth. Like that's how much plastic it's we own, like, produce. It's like distinguishable. It doesn't go away. Yeah. <laughs> that's why this is so important. Yeah. and. You know, on our end, we're more of like the, the clinical research of it. Right. So we wanted to test the concepts, but from your end of it, I mean, I'm sure you, you've heard about, you know, being an environmentalist, you've heard about things like the great uh, ring of plastic that's in. Oh, right. Yeah. Or, I don't, I, yeah, yeah, I don't know what they call it. Yeah. yeah. It's um, almost the size of Texas or no, Alaska. And that's. Well, Which is the biggest state. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, and it's just floating around because the way our, or the way the ocean currents are, mm -hmm. it goes around and actually the United States just kind of pushed the plastic out there and it went because we don't have any room for it. We have nowhere to put it. I mean, we just keep constantly producing and producing and producing with for it nowhere to go. We use it like think about how many water bottles you drink in your lifetime mm -hmm. and every day we use it and it has to go somewhere. We have nowhere to put it. It doesn't decompose. And I, I think especially so they put it in the ocean <laughs> with, with science. Things like figures, raw data, raw numbers, really, they're eye-opening. You can't, you can't, yeah, but you can't turn away can't from it. Yeah, but people can't always, um, like, put that in their brain. Not everyone has the ability to mm -hmm. look at that, and I think that's a huge problem with people knowing anything about it, actually, is because no one really understands it, because it's not that they're not educated, it's just not a common knowledge, which it should be. Which is why when you yeah. hear... So when you throw out those numbers, you throw out yeah. that stuff, it's like, oh my God, but no one really knows what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, and and when but when you simplify it for people and then they hear, well, every day there's over... 7.5 billion people on the planet. Yeah. How many people are using water bottles? Yeah, like, how many people are using people? water bottles? One number I heard in regards to fishing line, which is plastic, mm -hmm. is that the circumference of the earth that amount of, of fishing line is just discarded into the ocean on a daily basis. Oh, Melanta, wow. that's a lot. So, yeah. Wow. So, They're pretty big, I mean, compared to us, yeah. So when you hear stuff like that, when you have a, when you put it into that perspective for people. Well, that's kind of what keeps to, the barge together, yeah. too, is all the fishing nets fishing and stuff net. like that. When we did the beach cleanup in Seaside, actually, it was probably about, like, 25, 30 pounds of fishing net that we had to drag all the way down the beach just to get out of the water. Jeez. It was huge. And I mean... You, sea turtles, animals, seagulls could all go in there. And that that has Sad. many implications. Mm -hmm. yeah. You could say that it's damaging our local ecosystem, right? Which is a fact, it's very apparent. But even from an economic standpoint, people, people who aren't necessarily moved by the environmental issue, you could say, well, 
what impact is that having on your local economy? You know, people mm-hmm. don't want to swim in that. People, right. people don't want to swim in the... Uh, right. It makes it, well, it looks bad for an overall country as well. Yeah, and as a, like, yeah. People, the first thing they think of a lot of times when you say China, everyone's like, oh, a mass-producing country. You know, and you think about it, that mass-producing country also has massive amounts of pollution in the air. Mm-hmm. And it's to the point where, I mean, they have... Um, what is that code red for smog or whatever and and then that's in the majority of their cities so no one wants to really go in those areas so Ch- that's a China big is thing. an emerging nation uh, in, emer- in emerging in the sense of industrialism right mm-hmm. they're on the brink of becoming a, you know one of the biggest economic yeah. powers mm-hmm. if so if not you know they already have right well that's what's that important back. to them and people like to stigmatize them for that mm-hmm. but you also have to consider China, perhaps ironically, is the number one country to invest in green energy. Well, that's true, but so, my point was, I mean, like, when you look at us as a country, when you're saying, like, you don't want corporations to go swimming around in dirty water, yeah. it's the same thing, like, I'm, I was just using China as an example. You don't want to go, a lot of people are turned off by China, because yeah. when they think of it, they think of, that's oh, the disgusting, that this, yeah. well, which is why, but no one knows about how efficient China is in actually renewable energy. Yeah, well, it might also be a product of their circumstance because right. they True. because they have had to yeah. use coal and fossil fuels to sure. achieve this status yeah. of it's, they've really seen a lot of damage yeah. and it, i guess it's maybe gotten more into perspective i guess you can say china's also enormous it's a, yeah. so it took a long time i guess yeah so that makes a lot of sense also because it is huge <laughs> yeah but it's definitely ironic how in the united states we try to point the point our finger at other countries and yeah. say, why don't, you, why don't you try to do what we're doing? You yeah. know, we're the leader on this issue A, B, or C. Yeah. But in regards to clean energy, as ironic as it may sound, China, who yeah. is perhaps one of the biggest polluters, is also one of the biggest investors in, in clean energy. Mm-hmm. It's uh, almost like you kind of want to say, like, America, put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. 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 I think, That'd be awesome. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think that might be a bit a turning point in our in our country. Um, you have, but you gotta that, have mass yeah. majority of people to actually want that. Agree with that. Yeah. especially yeah. in the economic cir- circumstances we find ourselves in today. We need, you know, these issues are a eye opening, but mm-hmm. b they serve as almost like a goal for us. Mm-hmm. Which it should be that. It, sh- it should yeah. be a goal. It yeah. should be a goal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to have mm-hmm. to be regardless of whether we want it to be or not, mm-hmm. because ultimately there are two options, two r- roads you could take. We you change could, or we don't. We die. Yeah, we could. <laughs> we could change the the systems that we're using now, and everything's all right. And or ultimately choose not to choose to be ignorant of the issues that we're facing and, and face immediate whatever happens yeah, I mean, <laughs> humans are no human beings are no different than any other species we we require t- we have two biological ultimate goals reproduction and nutrition or mm-hmm. like every other organism we want to reproduce we want to pop you know reproduce keep our, keep our species, keep our species going. going and we want to stay we, alive we eat. stay alive yeah, yeah. Um, but sometimes don't you think we take that maybe a little too seriously? We kind yeah. of mass produce that idea yeah. because actually one of the leading causes of environmental destruction is the way we do intake our nutrients is yeah. through the meat industry mm-hmm. and things corresponding to that that have pesticides sprayed all over them like our vegetables and stuff like that. So it all so much that goes. Yeah, there. there's a lot. There's a lot to it. Um, as, as we seek those two biological objectives. We forget to remember, live. or we, yeah, we forget to live. I think, uh, but we also to almost put on the back burner that we're no different than any other species, which mm-hmm. means that we face the risk of extinction just like just every, as much as just any as other much species. as any other species. And being, you know, in ecology, we learned about K selected species versus R selected species. K selected species, you know, human beings, we might have like one or two children. And, but we're, we live 80 to 90 years. Uh, our selected species, you think of like insects or something, they have hundreds of thousands of progeny or offspring, 
and they have a relatively short lifespan. Like cicadas. Like cicadas. Yeah. Being a case selected, being a member of a case selected species, human beings are at higher risk of extinction. And as we enter what because we don't produce rapidly. Yeah, because we don't produce rapidly. We have long lifespans, but right. we. But that's not a good. Well, those can end any yeah. day. <laughs> so <laughs> they're not. That our life's not permanent. Yeah. So. This is yeah. This is all like very. I feel like this is good stuff for us to always consider, think about, and uh, yeah. We hope that you guys join us next time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. A little spacey. <laughs> so yeah. um. I see Danielle's hair. Okay, so like, Danielle. Wrap it up, Dale. Thanks. All right. Yeah, thank, thank you guys thank very much. Thank you guys for, for having us. Thank Ocean County College, TV20. Um, There's only one Earth. Only one Earth. <laughs> Can't forget it. Thank you guys very much. Thank you guys. <laughs> only one TV studio. Only one TV studio on Ocean That's County it. College. That's it. Just one. Campus. How long have you been sitting in this chair, dude? I'm literally trembling. Probably like an hour. TV. Uh, we can go in if you want. That's it. I'd rather not see what I'm Dude, dropping knowledge. Dropping knowledge. Okay. So I had a bad. I'm such like social awkwardness, like oh when I'm trying to talk. I have like, to look at someone in the face. I'm thinking like, as I'm like.